So, okay, great, those are airplanes. So that tells you that the neural net isn't latching onto the thing that we would think of. We think, oh, white face, black circles around the eye, cute little ears, must be a panda. And it's latching onto something different. Okay, and it's even worse than that. So these were hand-tailored examples. If you know the image and you know the loss function, you know everything about the neural net, you can you know, reach in and take gradients and fool around like this. But it's much worse than that. You can make universal adversarial noise patterns that pretty much fool any classifier on any image. Uh, this is a piece of wool. I have some sympathy for that. It does kind of look like that. But this is an Indian elephant. I object. Uh, that is clearly not an Indian elephant. Um, and so is that, by the way. Um, and, and so, so the, Doug, yeah. these fooling patterns, is it, is it the fact that they have edges? Is that why they're so efficient at fooling? So I don't know exactly what it is, but while I was thinking about this, it occurred to me that these might be the most unreal images you can find. So they're constructed in a way similar to that last panda attack, where you start at an image and then take the gradient away from the correct answer as quickly as possible. So you can think of that as kind of normal to the manifold of real images. Then you go to another image and do the same, another image do the same, do this many times with some clever renormalization. Re and um, you end up with you know, patterns like these. And they actually found 100 dimensional space of such patterns. Um, any li linear combination of them works just as well. Then they actually trained against those patterns. So they taught the neural net to recognize these patterns and know that they're adversarial noise. And then they started over with that and found a different set of patterns. And they still work just as well. So you, you can't train your way out of this. You might think you could just teach it to learn, you know, oh, recognize images that have been perturbed that way. But it's, it's plain whack-a-mole. You're in such a high dimensional space that there are always new directions it can go that, that fool it. Um, so the, anyway, the authors of this paper suspect that they're constructing a subspace orthogonal to the manifold of real images, and then any direction in that space takes you off the manifold, and, and the, uh, the class boundaries are foliated like some kind of Greek pastry or something, you know, uh, near the real manifold. So as soon as you get off it, everything breaks. Um, there are things you can do about this. There's something called a perturbation rectified network, but looking at the time, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, a better approach than that, because that kind of thing is sort of targeted at solving one specific problem, a more general approach uh, developed by uh, Alexander Madri's group at MIT here and, and others elsewhere is um, to change your training to be more adversarial robust, adversarially robust. And before we were minimizing this loss function, over theta, find the thetas that give the best performance on the training data. Now what we're going to do instead, and, and this, this is kind of fun, stay with me here, we're going to have a model for what the adversary could do called delta. So maybe delta is a little ball around your image in uh, um, image space, you know, those, that specifies the region the adversary is allowed to perturb the image to, uh, or it could, it could be anything. But you have some idea of you know, what, what the sort of attack is, and that's represented by delta. And then we're going to take the max of the loss function over delta. So this says find the worst case scenario for delta. Then minimize, find the thetas that minimize the badness of the worst case scenario. OK, this is a much harder optimization problem, but it's doable. You can still solve it with stochastic gradient descent. It takes 10 or 100 times longer, but you can do it. Um, but you have to be careful how you specify delta, okay, because the most naive thing is say, oh, delta, let's just use those one-step gradient attacks like we used to turn a pen into a given and call that the worst case scenario. So you can do that, but it doesn't work for the following reason. You, you want to be rearranging your whole fitting function so that it doesn't do stupid things anymore. And all that does, all that, you know, using a one-step gradient attack as the uh, worst case scenario, it puts a little kink, and I think I can zoom in on that, it puts a little kink at the loss function by uh, your example. So the way to think of this is 
uh, imagine this is our panda, and we have, this is the steepest gradient away from panda, so they're gibbons over here. In this direction, they're more pandas, okay? So what we're doing is saying, okay, let's just bend the loss function a little bit so that the steepest gradient now points in the direction of more pandas. Problem solved. But that, that didn't solve the problem at all. It solves the problem for exactly that image and nothing else. If you land here anywhere else, you still have the same problem. So there are a lot of things like this that's called gradient masking. There are a lot of things like this that, that sound good and they just fail. Okay. Um, now let's, let's jump to the physical world for a minute because we've been taking gradients in pixel space and that's, that's fun and all. But how well does this transfer to real things in real life? Question. Yep. If you take your panda image and the variation all recorder and you look at the latent space in two, two dimensions and then you add your noise, or just the, the, the um, spot in two dimensions with the noise added. Right, so that's, that depends very much on the autoencoder. Was it trained in some adversarial or robust way or is it just kind of some standard thing? Um, uh, in, in the latter case, I suspect in the latent space, you would move from some representation of panda to some representation of given. Right? I mean, the fact that it's an autoencoder is not going to save you if if it's abstracting the image out in the wrong way to start with. So yeah. Can we stretch also this on the thickness of the manifold? You know, if you just not be just you know concerned about having one manifold, but just change it a little bit with delta, or but the delta could be anything, right? Could it be something like that, and then then you have room that. Up, you know, up to this thickness, if you just move it a little bit, you're not lost. Actually, I'll tell you in a bit what works better. Okay. Um, so uh, let's put tape on stop signs. Has anyone seen this paper? Uh, people who do machine learning things have. Michelle is nodding. Um, so this was fun. It, it kind of started with a saliency map, which I guess I'll come to. But uh, you can ask a neural net which part of the image was important for your decision. And you can even ask specifically the difference between stop sign and for speed limit 45. What parts of the image tell you about that difference? And the neural net identified some spots it was particularly sensitive to. And so if you put pieces of tape on the stop sign, it's now uh, speed limit 45 with 100% confidence. <laughs> and this works at different distances and angles and lightings. It's really quite robust. Um, it's not there. Yeah. Yep. It's and, and actually, I should say, a hundred percent of their trials, it got the wrong answer. There's also some confidence estimate. Yeah, you're looking for the speed limit 45 sign. So this is disappointing if you thought that a neural net street sign identifier had learned that big red octagonal things are stop signs. That's not what it learned. And maybe it didn't learn red is important because we didn't show it green stop signs and label them not stop signs. Okay, so you can play whack-a-mole again. You can think of counterfactual examples and train it and, and force it to recognize things like that. But that's, you know, there are a million such things you could try. And so that's not a good way to go. So what should we do about this? Right, and it's not, I don't think someone's gonna like go put tape on stop signs next to the Google headquarters uh, so their <laughs> cars crash. Um, but, but it's more subtle than that. I mean, here's an example where instead of perturbing a small part of the sign by a lot, they perturbed all the sign by a little bit. So it just looks kind of faded and dirty. I mean, that's a real stop sign. Right? We're used to that. We don't even see it. Um, but this was classified as speed limit 45, 100% of the time also. Um, I was going to talk about transfer learning and bad nets, and that's kind of cool. You can install backdoors in a neural net, and then the neural net doesn't forget them after you transfer learn. But let's not talk about that. Uh, let me skip ahead. Distillation is fun. In the end, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> there are lots of other things you could try that don't work. This, I think, is very promising. Okay, deep K nearest neighbors. So uh, this is a paper by Papineau and McDaniel. So he was a grad student with McDaniel and, and then went to Google and now he's going to Toronto. Um, the idea here is to address the underlying cause of poor model performance 
on malicious inputs rather than attempting to make particular strategies fail, which is what a lot of the other work had, had done to that point. And so they, they do several clever things in this paper, but the, the basic idea is that we're going to follow not only our input image through the layers of the neural net, so we're representing this vastly complicated model with three layers here, Okay, um, so when it goes in, there may be other pandas near it. As it go through, goes through the layers, there should still be other pandas near it. If I add some adversarial noise to the panda and turn it into a school bus, it will still have pandas near it in the lower layers, and it kind of snaps to school bus uh, in the upper layers, at least that's the idea. So we're not just following the input through, we're following all of the training data through, following all the other pandas and all the other school buses. And we're asking how many, you know, if you think this is a panda, how many other pandas should be near it as we go through? If you think it's a school bus, how many other school buses should be near it as you go through all the layers? Um, and by near, by we're, we're using a very naive metric. What do you mean of, by should? Um, in, a, uh, in a set of training data that was not used <coughs> to actually train the neural net, but was used to calibrate <coughs> this, how, you know, it's, it's a frequentist should. You know, what is the frequency of school buses nearby a given school bus, typically for real school buses. So you have some calibration data set that you calibrate that on. You do that for every class. So there's a lot of computation done up front, but once you've pre-computed all that, you can do this very quickly. And it's a good way of getting at the question, has someone messed with my panda? Right? Because